took video and took pictures for, throughout the day. By the time I got home this evening, the, everything but the tail was under the ground. Huh. And we're thinking, what in the world? Is that a snake? You know, is that some kind of possum or something? And so uh, I very gingerly uh, got a shovel and lifted it out. And wouldn't you know, it was beetles that oh. were pulling that squirrel underground and they'd already eaten wow. most of his hair. I, I've never Good seen or heard anything like that. Yeah. Wow. Like that. Some yeah. sort of zombie apocalypse down there. Florida. <laughs> I'm going to be real careful next time I lay out in my backyard. I can Good tell you that. Night. <laughs> That's a different kind of beetle than we have in Oklahoma. Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They gained my respect today. <laughs> Those might be Comanche beetles. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. Okay. Hey, we're just about a minute ahead of time, but let me go ahead and get us started. Um, welcome to this uh, Q&A panel. We have with us the 2024 <laughs> presidential candidates, the ones that have been announced that are willing to be nominated for the Southern Baptist Convention presidency coming up this June in Indianapolis. My name is Tom Askell. I'm the pastor of Grace Baptist Church, president of the Founders Ministries here in Cape Coral, Florida, and I'm going to be our host for the time together tonight. So thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to our panelists, we have Clint hmm. Presley, Jared Moore, Mike Kibbone, and David Allen. I'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves to us in a moment. Uh, but first, let me mention just a brief word about the format for tonight, and then I will lead us in prayer, and we'll get going. Uh, in the upcoming annual meeting, the Southern Baptist Convention will elect, or the messengers will elect a new president to lead us for this next year. Bart Barber will complete his second year of a two-term um, no, a two-year term, and the four men with us tonight are the only ones so far who've been announced as candidates, and they've agreed to answer some questions about key issues that we're facing as Southern Baptists. We plan to end this conversation no later than 8.30 Eastern time. That's about 90 minutes from now. I sent these brothers uh, six areas uh, or six topics that are related to areas that I would like for them to address tonight. But I haven't sent them any questions ahead of time. I have some questions I've thought out, and we will see you know, just how the conversation goes. might lead to some other things as well. But let me lead us in prayer, and then we are going to uh, jump right into it, and I'm going to ask each man to take uh, two minutes to introduce himself. But let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. We thank you for uh, the way you've intertwined our lives through the Southern Baptist Convention. We thank you for the convention and all the good that's been done through many, many generations. We want to see it continue to be an instrument in your hands for great good for the kingdom of Jesus. Thank you for Clint and Jared and Mike and David. And I ask that you help them to think clearly tonight, to uh, remember the things they've, they've thought about and considered and to be able to speak simply and honestly and in a way that would commend the Lord Jesus. We want this whole thing to bring glory to you. We want those who listen to be instructed and helped in their thinking about the future of the SBC. We thank you for the technology to do this. We ask that you would superintend it and that it might go smoothly for the edification of all who participate. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to go in this order, uh, Clint, then Jared, then Mike, then David. So just take two minutes and introduce <coughs> yourselves to our listeners. Talk about your involvement in SBC life, uh, why you have been willing to let yourself be nominated. So just two minutes or so, and I'll try to keep us on track with that. So Clint, brother, we'll let you start. Thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. I uh, have been in the ministry now 31 years, about the time I've been married. I've served four churches all around, uh, four different kind of churches, two in rural Mississippi, one in Alabama, where I served Dolphin Way, and then Hickory Grove Baptist Church, where I am now. I've been here 15 years, and I love this church. In fact, this is my home church. This is where I became a Baptist. I was a mm. really quiet Presbyterian until I wandered into a Baptist church, heard a man open the Bible and preach, and I knew that's the kind of preacher I want to be, a Baptist preacher. So I, uh, God has been good to us, and um, I love the convention. I've thought about running several times before. I've been approached. Uh, I've always made it to the nominating. Like I was going to nominate Willie uh, when he was going to run, and uh, that didn't come to pass. And this year, I sensed that it was a good time mm -hmm. to do that. I love the convention. I love what we do with missions. I'm thankful for our statement of faith. I love the fact that we plant churches and replant churches. I thank God for the seminaries. And uh, I just want to be a joyful leader in the convention. So I look forward to 
this coming June and uh, seeing everyone in Indianapolis. All right, Clint, thank you so much, man. It's, it's great to have a rehabilitated Presbyterian here uh, yes, sir. amongst the panel. So <laughs> thank you for that. Brother Jared. Tom, thank you for organizing this. Um, my, my name is Jared Moore and um, Dusty Devers, uh, SBC pastor in Oklahoma, is nominating me um, to be SBC president. Um, I was saved in a uh, Southern Baptist church when I was 17 years of age. I was actually raised Church of God of Prophecy. Started attending a Southern Baptist church with a um, with a buddy of mine, and then uh, came to Christ at 17. And it was uh, it was Southern Baptist who who taught me the gospel, uh, right doctrine, sound teaching. Um, they taught me to love the local church. They taught me to love my neighbor. Uh, to seek the lost with the gospel, to to help those in need. I went on my first mission trips as a teenager with Southern Baptists. Um, the people who made the biggest difference in my life was a actual a couple, Aaron and Beverly Barlow, and um, I was saved in uh, Walling, Tennessee, at Gum Springs Baptist Church, and they also ordained me uh, to the ministry. And um, you know, Aaron was a former Marine who served in Vietnam, and he was rough as a cob, but he loved Jesus, loved the Word of God. He sought to teach it faithfully. He built his life on Christ and his ethics, and um, I'm just grateful for him. And uh, he's the, he's, I mean, just, I've been in pastoral ministry in the SBC for 24 years now, and Aaron is the normal Southern Baptist. I mean, the, the guy who made the biggest difference in my life, I have met hundreds of Aarons at other churches now. And um, that's the SBC, man. And uh, I love the Southern Baptist Convention. I love Southern Baptist churches. Um, I believe that, I mean, we we have been a force um, that God has used in a mighty way uh, throughout the world. And uh, I want to continue seeing, you know, I want my grandkids to be able to say those same things Amen. that I just said. And so... Amen. Um, you know, it's for that reason that I'm willing to be nominated for SBC president. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Mike? Yes, sir. Tom, thank you for giving us this time. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mike Keybone. I'm from Lawton, Oklahoma. I get to be the pastor at First Baptist Church here in Lawton. Grew up in Comanche County. This is uh, where I've lived a lot of my life. Uh, grew up in small town Elgin, Oklahoma, in a alcohol and drug riddled uh, family, uh, all the mess and, and junk that comes with that, very unchurched um, family. And uh, I'm Native American, I'm Comanche, that's the tribe that I'm enrolled in, but I'm also Kiowa and Cherokee. And uh, First Baptist Church in Elgin, Oklahoma, uh, was the church that reached out to my family. And they, <laughs> I tell people, they, they tricked me into going to church with cookies and Kool-Aid and vacation Bible school. And, uh, and so once I got in that church house, uh, I, I got to experience the unconditional love of Jesus through some incredible people. Um, they knew the drama that was in my home. They knew, you know, dad wasn't in my life. Mom was in and out of my life and all the junk. And, uh, and they just loved me and they loved on my family. I mean, there were times when First Baptist Elgin, uh, you know, paid to get our electric bill back on, those kinds of things. And so I saw this, watched it, experienced. I heard the gospel over and over again throughout my time growing up as a child going to that church and then eventually a teenager. And then on November 1st, 1990, at the Cameron Baptist Student Union at Cameron University at Lawton, Oklahoma, that's when I was saved. And all of the things that God had shown me and taught me and all the things that he allowed me to experience came together on that one night when the Holy Spirit of God convicted my soul. And so it was through that ministry, through the Baptist Student Union, it's BCM nowadays, um, I was discipled, I was mentored, I was called to ministry, start serving as a part-time youth pastor in local rural churches, did that for a long time. Eventually, God uh, opened the door for me to do evangelism across the country, and then mm -hmm. full-time student ministry, and then now a pastor. So I'm a product of, course, of Southern so. Baptist ministry. And, uh, and so love the convention and love the opportunity to serve it. Amen. Well, thank you, Mike. All right, Brother David. Well, I was born and raised in Rome, Georgia, 
came to know the Lord when I was nine years of age, and God called me to preach when I was 16. And in fact, that was November of 1973. So just this past November, I've celebrated 50 years preaching the Word of God. Been a wonderful, wonderful ride following the Lord all of that time. I'm married to Kate, my wife Kate, my first wife. Uh, passed away of cancer after we'd been married for 37 years. And uh, then I married Kate. Uh, We've been married a little over seven years now. I have four children. I have nine grandchildren. Love every one of them dearly. And uh, I served as a student pastor for five years. In fact, I was the first staff member ever hired at Prestonwood Baptist Church when she started in 1977. And I was two months shy of my 20th birthday when I became the part-time student pastor there while I was still in college at the Crystal College. And uh, the Lord uh, let me serve there for five years. And then uh, I went to Southwestern Seminary, finished that work, and went into my first pastorate in 1982. Have pastored two churches for a total of 21 years. And then I've served as an interim pastor of 14 times, 13 churches. I was at one church twice as their interim. Mm -hmm. Had an opportunity to preach the word in all of those settings. Currently a member of Sunnyvale First Baptist Church there in the Dallas area. And uh, several people have been asking me over the last year or two to consider allowing my name to be placed in nomination to serve our Mm -hmm. convention. And, uh, Having prayed about that and thought about that, I really sensed God's leadership to do that. Amen. I've been a Southern Baptist, pastored two Southern Baptist churches. I've served on a, a trustee board of a Southern Baptist uh, seminary, taught 18 years at a Southern Baptist seminary. Currently, the professor of preaching, distinguished professor of preaching at Mid America Baptist Seminary, and dean of the Adrian Rogers Center for Preaching. and Then in the last couple of years, launched a ministry called Preaching Coach, where I work with pastors, and I coach pastors in the area of preaching and pastoral ministry, and so God has been good, and it's a pleasure to be uh, here on this opportunity to be interviewed with uh, my other three brothers who are also running for president. Amen. Well, thank you, David. Now, I'm going to try to steer us and uh, each one of you, give you an opportunity to answer the questions I'm going to ask and try to keep it to within three minutes or so. But it's not a hard rule. Everybody that knows Southern Baptist pastors just laughed at that statement in uh, three <laughs> minutes. But uh, but I do have a timer here I'm watching, so we'll try to do it. I just want it to be equitable. I want everyone to feel free, like they, they've uh, had ample opportunity to respond. So the first subject. I want to bring up is one that has been pressing in on us really hard the last few years, and that's uh, sex abuse and sex Mm. abuse cover-ups, including uh, the proposed sex abuse reforms, the Sex Abuse Implementation Task Force, and this new entity that's just been uh, announced. So Russell Moore, while head of the URLC, wrote that the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention tried to psychologically terrorize him using tactics, and I'm quoting him now, to create a culture where countless children have been torn to shreds, where women have been raped and then broken down. And then he later wrote, I was wrong to call sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention a crisis. Crisis is too small a word. It's an apocalypse. Uh, the question I have is, and I'm gonna, we're going to start in this order. Uh, Jared going to give you the question first. One, do you believe that Russ Moore's characterization is accurate and that the Southern Baptist Convention is rife with widespread sex abuse and or sex abuse cover-ups. Uh, is there a sex abuse crisis in the SBC? Um, you know, I grew up uh, Southern Baptist ever since I was 15, and um, I have nothing but fond memories of growing up SBC And so I can't imagine what folks, you know, have experienced. I can imagine looking back and having to think about being harmed in in my local church or my home church. Um, And so it's it's such a heinous sin whenever um, we hear of abuse in in a Southern Baptist church. Um, You know, the, the local church is supposed to be I mean, it's the only place on earth where the curse has begun to be overturned. 
Um, everywhere else is still under the curse, every other thing on earth except the local church. And so it's a, it's a serious, super heinous sin to, for a Christian, a professed Christian, to participate in that evil. Um, to answer your question, um, the short answer is no, there is not an abuse crisis in the SBC. Um, the records that we have of abuse in the SBC um, have been some Southern Baptist that have participated in this sin. And, you know, it, it's evil, it's wicked, but to say, you know, some have used language like it's systemic, is systemic abuse in the SBC, which means that the system caused it and it perpetuates it. And that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, since, since all this started with abuse reform, the SBC has spent over $10 million. And um, whether it's dealing with lawsuits or implementing the reform, um, you know, the good that has come out of it is the, you know, the Caring Well curriculum and the training on how to recognize and prevent abuse. But the bad that has come out of it is the witch hunt that took place and the empty rhetoric and then the money that has been wasted. There's no tangible proof that children are safer today in the SBC than they were five years ago before the abuse reform started um, being implemented. Okay. So, Jared, was it fair to characterize your position then that no, you do not see this as a widespread systemic problem? Obviously, any one case is a problem. And though there's been a lot of money spent, perhaps wasted, there has been some good that's come out of it. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, okay. yeah, I would say All so. Right. Well, very good. Thank you for that. So, Mike, I'm going to pitch this question to you. Do you think it's accurate to see that, say that the SBC is rife with widespread sex abuse or sex abuse cover up? I think it's, uh, you know, and how you frame the question is is probably the best way to answer this. And the frame that I'm working with is that we're dealing. I'm on, I'm a member of the ARITF and uh, okay. have been for the last two years. And so on a weekly basis, we are dealing with church leaders and churches that are going through the most awful times of their life because they're having to deal with this crisis. And it seems like, so I guess the easy answer for me is yes, I do believe that it's a crisis. And it's primarily because we're dealing with it all the time. And we're getting more and more reports of it. You hear about it more and more in the news. But the crisis comes in, not just in looking at the numbers or how many people are, are being affected, because that can be skewed. You know, two thirds of abuse cases aren't even reported to the authorities. And so we really don't know the depth and numbers of where this go. But what I do know is this, is that when a pastor or a victim is going through this, this is the worst crisis they've ever had to endure. And so I think it was necessary for us to look at the system and make sure that there wasn't any kind of systematic process that created this, that causes this, or helps promote, you know, promote this in any way, shape, or form. And so I don't look at the dollars as being dollars that were wasted. I think it was necessary for us to see where we were at and what was going on. I praise God that so far, it looks like there wasn't a systematic process that made all these things happen. But what it hasn't addressed is the definite abuse that we're seeing in lots of churches all over the country. And mm. as we've had as we've had conversations with different church leaders, with associational missionaries, directors of missions, it's amazing to me how little equipped our churches are. I would I would say a conservative guess based on just conversations and meetings that we've had with pastors, with leaders all across the country, I'd say it's easy to say more than 50% of our churches, and, and reminding us that many of our churches, or 100 people or less, have no systems in place whatsoever to prevent abuse or any policy or procedure in place to be able to walk through it when the crisis comes. And mm -hmm. so to me, I believe that is a crisis, and I think it needs to be addressed, and I think we're doing a good job in, in trying to do that. Yeah, thank you, Mike. We Based on your experience, could you venture a guess as to what percentage of Southern Baptist churches perhaps have experienced sex abuse or sex abuse cover up? Yeah, Lee, Tom, I, I wouldn't be able to, to give okay. you an, an accurate indication of that. But, you okay. know, most recently we've had a church in Arkansas. Most recently we've had a church mm -hmm. for 
you know, in, in Oklahoma, uh, that's a prominent church here. Uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, and then what Jared said made me think of this, you know, we had a pretty high profile personality. Um, when, as soon as we started our work and started talking about things that we're going to be doing and implementing and trying to get done, we had a guy turn himself in. This is a guy that led worship at camps all over the country at Southern Baptist camps, uh, was in weekend events, although, I mean, this was a renowned uh, worship leader who turned himself in because he knew that we were creating a safer culture in the changes that were coming. And so, okay. uh, so I think what we're doing is, is necessary. It's good, but I know, you know, there's, there's a lot, we just know from, you know, and maybe if you want later on, I could give you a, a better number on just what okay. we, we've heard from leaders across the country. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. I'm going to pitch the question to you. Well, there's no doubt that sexual abuse is a serious issue. I mean, it is a sin. (laughs) It is criminal. Uh, It is an egregious sin against a fellow human being. However, I cannot uh, agree with Russell Moore on the language of crisis. And the reason I can't is because 48,000 Southern Baptist churches and uh, that many pastors, associate pastors, other staff, and lay people within those churches. Uh, and yet what we do know, what we, what numbers that we do know, even though we recognize there are numbers we don't know, but what we do know, the percentage is such that it simply can't be legitimately described as a crisis. Now, that said, that doesn't mean that we should sit back and say, well, we're, we don't have a crisis, so we can just mm-hmm. rock along. No, we can't do that. Sexual abuse can't be ignored. Survivors deserve justice. They deserve to have their voice heard. And I believe the convention must do everything responsibly within our power to prevent sexual abuse. You know, those who are the most vulnerable among us have to feel safe in our churches. And everybody agrees with that. We all concur mm-hmm. Now, we may not all concur with what is the proper mechanism to go about fulfilling and accomplishing that goal, but we certainly all agree we can't sit back and do nothing. We must do something. And for what has been done and the attempts that have been made over the last five years, I applaud every one of those attempts. Whatever decisions we make as a convention, though, I think this issue has to be dealt with ultimately at the local church level, because the local church level is where accountability begins. But that doesn't mean the SBC should not be involved. She certainly should be and do everything reasonably <clears throat> possible to provide training and information to church leaders uh, and abuse prevention, survivor care. And we are going to need heavenly wisdom here in the immediate future to work together to address the issue. We've got to do it with biblical principles, genuine compassion, a financially prudent plan, sound legal strategies, and methodologically wise blueprints for action. That would be my just summary take on it. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Clint. Yes, sir. Yeah. uh, You know, just one victim one survivor is a crisis and so the christian impulse is to run toward that crisis and that's what the sbc has done in many ways but the bomb dropped on us created such a fog that we didn't see clearly and with that fog cleared up a little bit we are seeing this is not a a system-wide crisis it is a crisis but it's not showing up in every church however every church needs to be prepared every church needs to react One of the great things that's come out of this is a heightened awareness of the need to train and screen uh, to protect the vulnerable, to report it when we see it. Um, So there are some good things that have come out, but Mm. to call it a systemic problem, I think overstates. I think that uh, Heath Lambert has actually done a really good job. I don't know if you've seen the four part series he put out. It was really Mm -hmm. balanced and uh, I actually found that very helpful. Yeah, well, that's good. And I appreciate the, the candor that you brother showed to a very sensitive, de- delicate uh, question. Everybody's against sex abuse, sex abuse cover up, certainly. But even the way you can describe that can uh, 
raise questions in, in people's minds. But let me ask you this. Some of the proposals that we've seen floated around um, have suggested that we ought, to, as Southern Baptist churches, through the cooperative program, all be willing to financially participate in um, the training and if there's any kind of remuneration to be given to sex abuse survivors, that every church should be willing to own that for any church where that might have taken place. So just kind of a, a quick um, response to that. Would you support that type, a, a proposal that suggests that a victim who needs to be remunerated to help her or him because of the mistreatment, uh, that money should be pulled from all churches to pay and help that person who was abused or had her abuse covered up in one church uh, that's in a distant state. Jared, we'll start with you again. You, and you just give me a yes or no, um, or just a 15 second response. Yeah, the, the answer is no. The SBC is not a denomination. We are a voluntary um, association of churches, and my church is not responsible for what another church a thousand miles away did. Okay. All right. Mike? I think it's hard to do that in 15 seconds, um, but I think that there needs to be some clarity in the fact that, that that's not what's being asked. Um, we're, not yeah, right. asking, we're not asking churches to do that um, at all, and, and so— uh, so I think, you know, because of that, I'd say that that's not even on the table. Okay. So you wouldn't be in for, be for it because some people have suggested it. I know it had nothing official has been proposed. You wouldn't be for that? Well, I think the beauty of Southern Baptist is the voluntary cooperation that we have, yeah. that if a church right. wants to help, they should be able to. If they don't okay. want to, then you know, they don't have to, right? I love that. Okay. Very good. David? Well, I think it's a bridge too far when we want to say that, look, Southern Baptist churches that have not committed sexual abuse and are not involved in that, and in that sense, they are quote unquote innocent. I think it's a bridge too far to say that they should be or must be involved in trying to pay remuneration for the sins of others. I don't think that's uh, right. I think that's a form of corporate guilt for sexual abuse. I think that is unwise and I, it even op opens the door uh, to lawsuits, in fact. Uh, and I think we need to be very careful how we, the lingo that we use. But of okay. course, any church that wants to be a part of helping another church in this or any other area, financially or otherwise, yes. certainly has the freedom to do so. Okay, very good. Clint? Yeah, that's what I would say. That a church has the freedom to do that uh, should not be held responsible to do that. Okay, very good. So, uh, if God makes you president of the SBC, you're going to have to address these issues, respond to uh, allegations that there's still widespread sex abuse and cover up in the SBC. How would you like to frame a response? to get people thinking more accurately about what is going on in the SBC and God willing, what we will do better in the future. Mike, we're going to start with you on that question. And then David, you'll get the follow up after that. Well, I think the the centerpiece would have to be the fact that we all hate abuse mm -hmm. and we need to figure out where the problem is and where it's not and address the problem where it's at. Um, what we've seen, you know, the crisis isn't this systematic, uh, thing that we thought we were looking for it what we found is that you know there our churches are not equipped to handle this and that is an absolute crisis and we also found out that our polity allows for abusers to be able to go from church to church state to state all over the country uh, without any kind of check in place and and so those are you know things that we've been able to find out and see that are that are awful things and so i think there are some things we can all agree on that need to be looked at, look, you know, need to be changed. And I think we need to get input from everybody. And I think every voice, you know, all, all of us as candidates represent a different voice across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of us, you know, agree, some of us don't agree, but I think every voice needs to be in the room to address it because of the areas that we come from, because of the voices that are looking to us for leadership or the people that are looking for us for leadership and they want to know what our voice says. So, so my heart would be to unify us in this and try to figure out, how can we do this together as a convention? Because this can't be a my thing or your thing. We've got to look at the issue, re figure out what it really is, and then address it in the right way with unity. Okay. Thank you, Mike. David? 
Well, at every level, including the local church level and then on upward uh, associations and state conventions and even the SBC, we need to raise the awareness of the serious issue and sin of sexual abuse. We need to do everything we can to provide training, everything we can to provide resources. But whatever we do, I think there are these five key things that I mentioned earlier have to be the foundation of what we do and how we do it. We have to make sure that our response is grounded in biblical principles. We have to make sure that we are acting with genuine compassion towards survivors. They need to be heard and know that they are heard and know that we know that they are hurting and that there is care that is needed and that we are not in any way turning a deaf ear. We also have got to have a financially prudent plan to address this. And I think some of the mistakes that we have made in the past are now coming back to haunt us financially because uh, we are expending a lot of money to defend lawsuits that we're facing. And then that would lead to sound legal strategies. That sexual abuse is not only a, a moral issue and a sin issue, it's a legal issue. You know, it's not just like... Uh, you know, telling a white lie here. This is serious, serious stuff that has serious legal ramifications. And we must have sound legal strategies. And finally, a methodologically wise blueprint for action. Whatever we do, we've got to do something. We can't sit back and do nothing, but we have to get wisdom in our blueprint for action. So these are some of the things that I would, would think we need to have front and center in our SBC on this issue. Okay, thank you. Clint? Let's see. Clint, I don't know. Did we lose Clint? I'm Clint? sorry. Yes, sir. Okay, go I ahead. would say that uh, some of the things we've already seen happen, and that is that there's a raised awareness. I mean, 2018, we were not talking about sexual abuse, and there was sexual abuse. From 2019 forward, I mean, it has been the topic on our Foremost of, our, foremost of our conversations. I mean, we talk about this all the time and rightly so. So I think we want to keep raising the awareness and not, uh, not get the fatigue that has been discussed and make sure that we don't stop doing that and then equip our churches. Uh, I think Mike probably was right in that there has been, you know, a really, a real deficiency in equipping the churches because that's where it's going to matter. Mm -hmm. You can talk all you, you want at a denominational level, uh, but really where it matters for me is at Hickory Grove Baptist Church. I want to make sure that the people at Hickory Grove are equipped and have been screened and we know who we're dealing with, that we can take care of the vulnerable. And then when there is a problem, God forbid, that we actually do uh, care for the survivors. And previously, we just have not talked it through. So one of the strangely beneficial things that's happened is this raised awareness. And now we're learning what to actually do to help victims. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me follow up on this uh, with something that's just recently been announced. The Abuse Reform Implement Implementation Task Force that's chaired by Josh Wester announced the formation of an independent abuse response commission that will help Southern Baptist churches quote, prevent and respond to sex abuse, which each one of you have said needs to be done. Uh, Mr. Wester initially announced that Send Relief, the International Mission Board and North American Mission Board organization, would fund this new organization. But Send Relief then pretty quickly denied that assertion. And now, recently, the ERLC has announced that they're going to give $250,000 of their budget to this new organization. So here's the, that's the background to these questions. What do you think about the formation of this independent commission? And do you think that cooperative program dollars should be used to fund it? Uh, so David, we're gonna start with you on that. Well, I'm not fully sure what I think about it. And, that, and the reason is there is so much uh, fogginess about the announcement of the new uh, 501c3 mm -hmm. and uh, how it's going to be funded. And at first it's going to be funded by uh, some of our entities and then no, uh, they're not going to be funding that. And then the ERLC is, is, is providing some money. Uh, 
to the uh, uh, the the uh, sex abuse task force, mm-hmm. then there's the question: Well, is that money? Does that money stay there, or is that money going to the refor- the new abuse reform commission? There's some fuzziness there. So there's a lot of a lot of un- uncertainty right now about mm-hmm. all of that. And so I think individual Baptists should be free to form whatever associations or groups you know, they desire. And Mm -hmm. that's what this group is. But I'm concerned uh, and would be concerned since this group is independent and not under any accountable control from the SBC, I'd be concerned with any (coughs) money going uh, to that group. If churches want to voluntarily give to that group, that's another thing. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. uh, I would not be in favor at this point where there is no accountability to the SBC, an independent organization receiving funding from cooperative program money. Okay, thank you. Brother Clint? Yeah, it's made me a little nervous with uh, the entity heads that were so slow to sort of get behind uh, what we've seen. I just think we just don't know enough um, Mm -hmm. about how that works. It seems odd. And uh, for some of us, we want to think through uh, how is that going to be like, we want to support what is good. We're just not convinced yet that that's the right thing to do. Mm. Okay. Very good. Uh, Brother Jared. Um, There's no evidence that this new entity will actually help prevent more abuse in the SBC and it to a blank check to another ministry. I think would be the the wrong move. Um, I think we should call the local police, and uh, in order in order to do what they're wanting to do with a database, it seems that they have to have a number that people can call. But who? But in realistically, how are they going to? How are people in the local church going to get that number? And why not? Wouldn't it be easier for them to just call the local police? Um, and so that that's one of the big negative things about all this is that it, it, it's the the database is about offenders. It's not about um, you know it's about pre- preventing the second abuse, not the first. And um, and so I, I think that instead of forming a new entity, perhaps the um, executive committee could um, continue with the curriculum um, and and persuading churches. Um, to go through the the training just to you know to help keep the awareness you know and encourage uh, encourage churches to uh, because that's all you can do is encourage churches. We're Southern Baptist, mm-hmm. you know, we're not a top down organization, and so um, so I, I think that's what we need to do rather than um, try to reinvent the wheel. Is it honestly to me as a norm, you know, just a local Southern Baptist pastor? It sounds like uh, the SBC version of the FBI to me, <laughs> like, and and to think that we could investigate, um, you know, potential abuse claims, I think is so unrealistic and unachievable. I, I admire, I admire the guys, right? I admire their zeal, mm-hmm. um, but I just think that that they're mistaken. Okay, thank you, brother Mike. This might take me more than three minutes, Tom. Uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate uh, getting well, the last. Well, you know more than the rest of us. You've been working in uh, that task force, so. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad that going. I'm glad to bring some some clarity because I think there's there's quite a bit of misunderstanding, and so this is a great opportunity. So that's why this is a good good thing. Uh, so first of all, the first question is, what do I think? I love it. Uh, that's what I think. I think it's incredible. I think it's a great step towards where we need to be and what we need to do. But I think it's important to remember that we exhausted every effort possible to make this work within the SBC. And what we were told by various leaders was that this could not happen in the SBC, and it would not happen. So at that point, we had a decision to make. Are we going to just quit, throw our hands up and go, okay, well, it just can't be done? Um, Or are we going to try to find a way to make it happen? And so we went back, looked at where this stuff started at the very beginning, looking at proposals that even the original sex abuse task force had. And there was this idea to make a third party or to make this outside organization. 
And, uh, and we started looking at that. It helped in so many ways. In fact, we pitched this idea to entity heads, to associational missionaries, state leaders. We, we, we vetted it through all these, and everybody liked the idea. Uh, and so we started working through that idea, started looking at funding for that idea. And at no point in time in those discussions did we say, you know what, the cooperative program ought to fund this. That was not the, not the proposal, not the idea. But what mm-hmm. we did ask were that the entities consider, you know, using their boards, using their leadership, you guys consider what, how you might be able to help. And so, so far, the ERLC is the one who has stepped up to offer some help in that direction. And so we're not looking or asking for cooperative program dollars. And as far as the sin relief dollars go, we were under the understanding that through what was agreed upon at the convention, that that $3 million plus a million dollars for survivor care was given so that we could do our job with those funds. And so we had assumed that those monies were going to be available to help do what we were trying to do and, and to get to get ARC off the ground. And so uh, obviously that wasn't how Sin Relief felt and uh, and the leaders of that. And so we had a difference of opinion on how that was supposed to go. Mm. But we're still, you know, wanting to make sure that this is not funded with cooperative program dollars. And and even in the funding with the with Sin Relief, that was a you know that money was gonna be a one time thing. We weren't gonna perpetually go back to Sin Relief and ask for continued funding. But a part of our design is to be able to receive uh, funding from whoever would want to give to that cooperatively, okay. not not from the cooperative program. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. That's, that is clarifying. So let me just make sure I'm understanding too. The $250,000 from the ERLC, that was not cooperative program money that was given for this purpose. Is that correct? Is that the right it assessment? Was, well, what that really comes from um, is not from their budget. Um, okay. So that that was something that was voted on by the convention convention. Uh, a few years ago, and it was just never dispersed. And so now they're using that money that was voted on to be dispersed. They're using it now is is my understanding of that. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Well, let's shift gears to another topic, uh, something far less controversial, right? Women pastors uh, in the (laughs) SBC. Uh, You're not getting off easy, guys. Sorry, we're going to hit the hard ones. In 2022, Pastor Mike Law proposed an amendment to Article 3, Paragraph 1 of the Southern Baptist Convention Constitution. The proposed amendment would clarify that the SBC only cooperates with churches that do not affirm, appoint, or employ a woman as a pastor of any kind. Uh, That's the language of the amendment itself. Um, The amendment was referred to the Executive Committee, and under pressure from churches, the Executive Committee brought it to the floor for a vote in 2023 but did so while stating their opposition to the proposal. Now, as far as I know, I think that's an unprecedented action. I was trying to search back as far as I could. I don't recall when the executive committee has ever brought a motion to the messengers for a vote, but recommended that it be defeated. But nevertheless, (laughs) that happened. And uh, to become part of the Constitution, the amendment must be passed by two-thirds of the messengers and two years of voting. Uh, it passed overwhelmingly last year in 2023. It'll be brought up for a final ratifying vote in 2024. So h- here's the questions, brothers. One, do you think we have a crisis of women pastors in the SBC? And then two, uh, do you want the law amendment to be passed? So, uh, Clint, we're going to start with you. Okay. Yeah, I do not see it as a crisis, although I can see us pointed in that direction. And I do want the law amendment to pass. I signed it when it came out pretty early. Okay. Very good. Man, you gave back a whole bunch of time. That's awesome. I like that. I'm not (laughs) sure you're a real Southern Baptist preacher. You've got to lose some credentials here. Okay. Uh, Brother Jared. Um, I'm in favor of the law amendment. Um, I think it just repeats our confession. And... um, you know, the Credentials Committee asked for clarification, and this this answers their concern about, um, you know, what a what a pastor is. And um, the law amendment clearly states what a pastor is. I think our confession does, but this this states it even clearer to where it will be in the uh, Constitution. And um, you know, I, I think that we need to we need to pass it. I'm definitely in favor of it. And concerning if it's a crisis, what is, there's over 
I've heard reports that there's over what 1500 uh, SBC churches that have women pastors in some form or fashion. I think, I mean, that, that would be what, um, what is that? That I don't know what percentage that is. I'm, I'm a pastor, not a math guy, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but, uh, but, but anyway, that, that sounds like a pretty big deal, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's, uh, it's something we need to, to deal with now. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, well, we will go to brother Mike. I think on the answer to, do we have a crisis? Um, I think this is where we've got to be really careful again, because, you know, on one side, if we say we have 1,500 churches that may or may not, you know, but possibly have, you know, women pastors, and we call it a crisis here, but then we look at the sex abuse numbers that are very similar and say it's not a crisis there, then we have more than a math problem at that issue. And so we've got to figure out what, you know, we're going to call a crisis or not. I don't believe that it's a crisis. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be voting for the law amendment. Um, And the reason being is, and I need this to be really clear because there seems to be some doubt out there. I'm Mm -hmm. a complementarian. I Mm -hmm. I believe that the role of pastor is for men. I believe that. But here's what what I also believe. I also believe that what the system that we have now with our Constitution, with our statement of faith, is doing its job just fine. And okay. uh, we saw that when we dismissed the, one of the most prominent churches in our history for this very issue. And I think the, the bigger issue is that we have a credentials committee that is absolutely overloaded. And right now, you know, and I believe that the chairman of that committee is, is with us uh, on, on spaces, but in uh, conversation with him, 80%, about 80% of their workload is dealing with sex abuse. And so if we're able to get ARC to do what it's supposed to do, I think it would help alleviate some of that and let them get back to being at full function, what they're really supposed to do. And so I think that that addresses it. And so uh, and the other thing, Tom, I think is important to note, too, is that, you know, I I remember being in Andrew Hebert's office and he has this incredible picture of the convention. I guess at some point in time, it was a thing to take a picture of the whole convention. And it was I don't remember if it was in the 40s or 50s, but it was a long time ago. It was a black and white photo. And every single person in that photo was white. And, uh, and when I look at our convention from that time until now and see the incredible job that we've done to let the SBC look like what it's going to look like in heaven, every tribe, nation, and tongue, we've made so many great roads in with minority churches. And right now, minority churches are really afraid of this thing. And I think before we try to force something through, we need to at least ask the questions, you know, what, why is this causing so much pain? Why is this causing so much heartache? And then come to a solution. So I'm not saying that we should say no and get rid of it forever. I'm thinking we need to slow down and look at this a little better to see how it affects all of our churches, not just some of our churches. And so, but the short answer is I'm not for it. I won't be voting for it, uh, but Mm -hmm. I am a complementarian and I don't believe this crisis. All right. Thank you, Mike. I, I'm going to ask you one clarification. You you said that uh, 1,500 churches, women pastors, not a crisis. 1,500 churches, sex abuse uh, is a crisis. Are, are you saying that you know of or you suspect there's 1,500 churches in the SBC that are guilty of sex abuse? Did I misunderstand well, just, you? No, just looking at what the numbers that get thrown around, uh, you know, we're throwing around numbers and we're extrapolating numbers based on limited data and people are coming across, you know, with different numbers for different things. And I'm saying, if you're going to say this number is a crisis here, then it ought to be a crisis over here. Um, yeah. And so I'm not get ready to give any kind of exact number on that. We just don't know those things. But I think it's the same way in you know, when you're looking at whether there's women pastors or not. I think those aren't exact numbers. Those are extra, it's extrapolated data from a limited sample. Okay, very good. So, David? Well, the word crisis requires uh, a definitional high bar of either events or things that are happening to denominate something as a crisis. And so uh, I do not think that women pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention currently could be uh, accurately defined as a crisis. However, it is a problem. Uh, You know, Kevin McClure's article in the American Reformer back in June of 2023, after really careful research, identified more than 1,800 women who were serving in pastoral leadership roles in more than 1,200 Southern Baptist churches. 
Now, he was very careful. I read that article carefully. He was very careful to weed out people that were children's ministers, but who had the term pastor, a children's pastor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's not including those people in his data. He's talking about people who have the role of the pastoral leadership role and are in the office of a pastor or elder in a local church. If we have 1,800 women serving in those kinds of roles, we've got a serious problem because that is in violation of our doctrinal statement. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the law amendment is to simply clarify that doctrinal statement by placing a simple one-sentence statement in Article 3 uh, under number 1, and it would be point number 6, that would say that uh, we as a convention will only deem a church to be in friendly cooperation with the convention, sympathetic with its purposes, which affirms, appoints, or employs only men as any kind of pastor or elder as qualified by Scripture. Well, the qualifications that Scripture gives are for senior pastors and elders people in the role and office of a pastor. And so the law amendment itself would not address a nomenclature issue of someone who is a children's director, who is a woman, and she's called the children's pastor. Now, personally, I'd prefer that there's a different nomenclature there. I would rather they be called a children's minister or children's director. I would prefer us to reserve the title pastor for what the vast majority of Southern Baptists normally use that term to refer to, and that is the office and role and function of pastoral leadership uh, in a local church. So uh, even though I'm aware that we have those who do advocate for women ro in roles of pastoral leadership in direct contradiction to scripture and contrary to the Baptist faith and message, I'm also aware that most Southern Baptists affirm complementarianism, but I, I must say I do have the troubling feeling that some don't really believe it, but they are trying really hard not to tell us they don't believe it. And okay. so I consider this to be a watershed issue. I think the law amendment is an important clarifying statement. I, I recognize good and godly men and women can and do disagree on some things in this, and may the discussion continue between now and the convention, but I am unequivocally in favor of the law amendment for these reasons. Okay, thank you very much. At the 2023 convention, Pastor James Merritt, standing with four other former Southern Baptist presidents, made a motion that the current Southern Baptist president appoint a task force to study what it means to be in friendly cooperation with the SBC. The motion passed. Bart Barber appointed the cooperation group, as it's so-called. The chairman, Jared Wellman, announced that recommendations from that group would be given to Southern Baptists in January through March of this year. That has not happened, and Mr. Wellman has recently said that recommendations would be released well ahead of the annual meeting in June. So the questions I have for you men, you've already touched on some of this, is should the fact that the cooperation group has as its members, some members, pastors who have publicly advocated for and have women pastors on their staff, should that act have any bearing on how Southern Baptists view their recommendations? And when such recommendations are made, uh, how should autonomous Southern Baptist churches respond to recommendations from this important uh, cooperation group? So, Jared, we're going to start with you. Yeah, I think uh, having female pastors is sin. And so it's contrary to the Bible. It's contrary to our confession. And so to put put uh, folks on the committee, um, you know, I'm, I'm against anything less than adding male only pastors to um, our Constitution. And I assume that this committee was formed to present an alternative that is not the law amendment. And so since I'm in favor of the law amendment and I'm in favor of affirming our confession and our constitution, um, you know, I, I'll definitely be against what the cooperation group presents if it is less than the law amendment. Okay. Very good. Brother Mike. You know, I had a really good conversation with, with Jared about the cooperation group and 
Um, and one of the things that, that I loved about what he shared was, well, a couple of things. One of those is, you know, what, is act, what exactly is their job, right? What are they supposed to do? And their primary purpose is defining what friendly cooperation means. That's what they're trying to determine. They're not trying to be for or against the law amendment. They're trying to clarify what does it mean to be in friendly cooperation. And so I think that's an important note for us to remember in this group because they're not, <clears throat> you know, they're, <clears throat> they're trying to address the, the forest of Article 3.1, right? They're not trying to deal with the trees there. They're trying to say, how can we interpret this? Because whether it passes or it doesn't, we need good clarification on what does it mean to be in friendly cooperation at that point. And so, uh, so I think it's important to note, too. And then also, I think it's also rem- uh, important to remember that, that his group or his cooperation group doesn't have any obligation to give any report of any kind. They, in fact, they could, if they wanted to, give the report the day of. Um, but I do know that the report is going to be coming out. It's going to be coming out sometime in April. And, uh, and what really kind of shook up releasing it in March, which was the goal, was the fact that Easter fell in March. And so just getting everybody's schedules together to try to get that done, you know, the, the worst thing to do is to try to produce an, an unfinished report or, you know, one that hasn't been, you know, looked at very clearly. And so, mm-hmm. so they just put it off a little bit, but you're going to have plenty of time. Everybody's going to have plenty of time to look at those recommendations and none yeah. of those recommendations will have anything to do with the law amendment. Okay. Very good. So brother David. Well, I am in favor of cooperation. <laughs> That's why I'm a Southern Baptist. And I think though that we should be a little bit hesitant to speak about recommendations that have yet to be presented. And I know you're not asking us to speak to any supposed recommendations, but you did point out something in the beginning in your question, Tom, that I think is crucial. Uh, I do have a bit of concern about the history of this group's formation because the group was actually formed as a response to the law amendment. I think we would be less than forthright to say that and to admit that. And so I'm hopeful that this group will address uh, matters of cooperation, but not in the context of the law amendment. And hopefully they will not come to the convention with any kind of recommendation uh, that suggests that the law amendment should be defeated. I think that would be problematic. Uh, We know that every Southern Baptist congregation is autonomous and they can do whatever they please in terms of practice. But our Southern Baptist convention is also autonomous in its own right, and we do retain the right to set parameters of cooperation. So I look forward to their report. I'll be interested to see uh, what they uh, say, but we do have to think through carefully what it is we agree on and cooperate about and why we do so. But one thing is sure, we are a convention of churches. We exist because we have already agreed Agree on to agree on more than merely the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, we exist because we have agreed to even agree on a number of secondary issues. Uh, this is, of course, these are uh, issues that are stated in our Baptist faith. And some of those might even be tertiary issues that are actually stated there. So these are the kinds of things that I would hope we would think about as we anticipate hearing from the uh, cooperative group. Okay, thank you. And Brother Clint? Yeah, I would not want to be on that committee. A 20-person committee, who in the world <laughs> would want to be on a 20-person committee? <laughs> I, I, think that, uh, I think that if you're going to be on a committee for the convention, uh, you should at least be able to affirm the Baptist faith and message. Uh, I think that that recommendations coming from this committee will be just that, recommendations, and mm-hmm. churches can do with recommendations, what they want to do. So I, I don't. I, I think it would be really hard to get that group together to bring forth recommendations that are going to get us down the field. It will be miraculous if they do. But if they do, we'll celebrate the miracle. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, let's move on uh, to another important topic, and that is transparency in the Southern Baptist Convention and our institutions and agencies. 
Last year at the convention, there were two messengers, uh, David Norman and Rhett Burns, that both made motions. They're very similar, so I'm not going to read them both, but both are basically calling for transform uh, for transparency from our agencies and institutions to file publicly the equivalent of a form 990 that the income tax code uh, prescribes. They're not asking anything be done for the government, but for the churches, for messengers, so that there can be some financial accountability beyond the trustees into the actual churches themselves. So both of these motions were referred to the executive committee. I don't think the executive committee has yet announced whether or not they're going to be bringing either or combine them to bring out uh, both of them, but there's uh, that's under consideration at least. So let me just ask you, do you support this type of recommendation for this type of transparency for our entities and agencies? And so we'll start with that. We'll have another question following that, but Mike, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I agree there needs to be transparency. And I think the reason why there needs to be transparency is because of the amount of distrust there is in the convention right now. And so I think we're well on our way to repairing that. I'd love it that Dr. Orge is our president-elect. I think he's going to bring great leadership in all of these areas. And as far as transparency, as far as, and I don't know, he, he hasn't given me anything. I haven't heard talk, had the conversation. I want to make that clear. But I've seen his leadership, and I know he has a, has a high level. He's a godly man, great integrity, a great leader. And so I know he'll have good vision, wisdom, insight regarding this. Uh, but he, the, but with all the the distrust that is going on, I just I don't understand how something, uh, you know, how hiding things makes that better. I think if we can show it, there's nothing to be afraid of. We ought to be able to show it. And so, so I'm in favor of transparency. Okay, thank you, Mike. David. You know, I want to begin to answer this by what happened to me in 1982 when I was in my first pastor at my first month there. A wise deacon told me, Pastor, what people are not up on, they're down on. Good communication is the key to minimizing criticism. And he reminded me, as the old saying goes among Baptists, trust the Lord and tell the people. Well, I occasionally learn the hard way <laughs> the wisdom of his words. Now, we all know that leadership can't tell everything, nor should they. But good leaders resist maneuvering in a cloak and dagger fashion. Truly great leaders resist the urge to put their thumb on the scale when they know they have power and influence to do so. My A big part of my reason for running or being nominated, allowing my name to be placed in nomination, is this very issue right here. Everywhere I go, uh, I hear from pastors who tell me that they are losing trust in some of our entities or their leaders or some of our agencies or their leaders uh, because of what they perceive to be a lack of transparency. So I would, uh, I think that needs to be financial transparency and uh, content, doctrinal uh, or transparency from a content standpoint in terms of events and, th and things and discussions that are being had uh, in a given entity or, or uh, agency. So I would absolutely favor a motion, uh, for example, made by uh, Pastor Rhett Burns on financial accountability and transparency. I would certainly support a Form 990 not to be sent in to the government, but uh, to be provided to the people. I agree with what our new president-elect, Dr. Orge, of the executive committee said when he commented that rebuilding trust involves more than merely asking people to trust you. It involves doing things that are trustworthy so that people will naturally trust you. I think that's what we need to be and do in uh, the SBC. We need more transparency from our, our boards of trustees uh, and from our entities and our entity leadership. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Clint? Yeah, I do think we need uh, transparency. I, I want to be careful how we press that. It seems to me we've used the word trust quite a bit. And, uh, you know, embedded in the word trustee is trust. And we have a trustee system that we've been using for years. And the trustees are appointed to provide accountability, to give oversight, and to be able to look into every single thing. 
So we may want to look elsewhere. I mean, do we do we want to press our attention to the trustees? Uh, if we go the way of just absolute, everybody see everything, then why do you have the trustees? And why don't we press that all the way to every single entity that the SBC has? So I, I want us to be transparent. Yes, you don't want to be cloak and dagger. I would want to tear that and make sure that the trustees are the ones that are accountable and providing accountability. Okay, thanks, Clint. Let me just ask you as a follow up on that. Do you think the trustee system as it has been functioning over these last 10 or 12 years, that it's 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 good or does it need to be uh, revised in any way? We need to give attention there for this tr this transparency issue or, or are we just. That's a great question. I, I think. It? Yeah, I think that uh, you always want to be reforming. You always want to be paying attention to it. Always want to be making it better. <laughs> and by and large. If you look at over our entities and the trustees over them, you know, you do see things happen that are not good here and there. But for the most part, they've historically gotten the job done. Mm -hmm. okay. But I, do, I think it would be worthwhile to continue to educate, to make it better. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Jared. Yeah, I'm I'm in favor of financial transparency. I, I trust the trustees, but the question that has come up is, do the trustees trust Southern Baptist? Why can't we know how the money is spent at our entities? That it doesn't make logical sense. That doesn't work in a local church. Can you imagine if I told my church, just trust me um, on how the money is spent? Um, we are the ones who give to help fund these missions agencies and to encourage our agencies, our seminaries. And, you know, if they will, if they'll be transparent, I think it will increase cooperative giving. I think folks will, um, they know how the money is spent. So they'll be able to see the work in a better detail that you're doing. And what happened with Southwestern seminary under Adam Greenway's le leadership I think he spent money unwisely, and if there had been transparency to the messengers of the Southern Baptist Convention, it would not have happened. Okay, very good. Well, let me follow up with that. We're going to go in the same order. It's the same type of question. What is your view of entities requiring terminated employees to sign non-disclosure agreements or their equivalent of any of our entities? So let's start with you, Mike. What's your view of that practice? Golly, um, man, I, I think I hate the idea of, of signing those non-disclosure agreements. I just, to me, it feels like every time you're doing that, you're hiding something. And so I'm not in favor of it. I think there's a better way to handle that and do that. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not, not in favor. Okay. Very good. David. I'm definitely not in favor of that. I know it's a common practice in the business world. I don't think it needs to be anywhere in the uh, Christian world, whether it be churches, whether it be uh, institutions and so forth. So, yes, I I would be opposed to NDAs. Okay. Clint? Yeah, I would be, uh, in principle, opposed. There are some times when there's been such a, a breach or such a problem that in order to protect someone or their future, you know, a lot of times it's done for the person that is, is leaving. So in general, yes, I would be opposed. I think there might be times where you want to not give all the information out. Okay. And Jared? Um, I'm against uh, NDAs. Okay. Very good. I'm going to question your Baptist preacher credentials as well. Um, <laughs> So along the same line of transparency, at the 2021 Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, the night before the presidential election, a rumor was started and spread by several pastors that Mike Stone, who was a candidate for the presidency that year, had disrespected and spoken harshly to a woman known to be a sex abuse survivor. He asked, Mike Stone asked that the video surveillance footage of that area be preserved. It was preserved, and he has been told by the executive committee that the executive committee has a copy of it. And though some have seen it, it has not been shown to him or released publicly, though he has requested copies. For the sake of transparency, if you're president, will you call for the release of this video surveillance uh, for the Southern Baptist Convention? 
And we will start with David. I would indeed. And the reason I would do it is I'll go you one better. Uh, Mike Stone was told that the video exonerates him completely. And he was told also that he would be given a copy of the video. And to this day, as far as I know, he has not been given a copy. And this is the kind of thing that creates the kind of lack of trust in our convention. And so absolutely, uh, I would just be candid with you. Uh, if I'm president, I'm going to, I would certainly recommend and ask the EC uh, to release that since they initially, or at least their lawyer initially, did say he would have released that uh, to Mike and to the public. Okay, very good. Uh, let's go to you, Clint. Oh, yes, sir. I would absolutely release the video. I, uh, yeah, I think it ought to be out there, certainly. Okay, very good. And Jared. Uh, yes, I think it should have been released a long time ago. Okay, and Mike? Tom, would you ask that again? Because I think I heard yeah. something that okay. that I have a question about, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, so this, in 2021, uh, there was an accusation that Mike Stone had disrespected, spoken harshly to a woman known to be a sex abuse survivor. Uh, when that charge came out, he asked that the facility uh, would preserve the video surveillance footage of that area where the conversation took place. It was preserved. He's been told by members and representatives of the executive committee that it exists, that they have it. One told him that they've seen it and he has, was promised a copy of it. He's asked for it, but he's not been given one. So I'm asking the question for the sake of transparency, if you're president, would you call for the release of this video? I think if, if I were elected president, I would want to find out a lot more details about where this is at. I would want to know specifically, you know, if the video really does exist, I'd want to know that it exists. I would mm -hmm. want to know, you know, that we're not dealing with any kind of speculation or sensationalism. And if it in fact does exist and it accomplishes exactly what, you know, if it does exist, I think yes. But I think we've okay. got a lot to look at before that. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, let's shift gears and Talk about uh, a growing issue facing the SBC that's been referred to already tonight, and that is law lawsuits that are moving through, through the court systems, various courts and various uh, levels of the system, and they're all related to Southern Baptist Convention interests. And I'm going to just mention some of the more prominent ones uh, that have been addressed publicly and some still waiting further adjudication. Uh, there is Roe versus Patterson. Uh, there's Johnny Hunt, who's suing the SBC, the Executive Committee, and Guidepost Solutions. Will McRaney in his lawsuit against the North American Mission Board. David Seals' lawsuit against many uh, specific individuals and entities in the SBC. There is a RICO case uh, that the details of which are not real clear in my mind still, but it's developing and uh, seems to have a lot of potential for downsides if, if things are proven to be true there. And then most recently, Adam Greenway in his lawsuit against Southwestern Seminary and, and one of their representatives as well. So I just want to get your take on it. None of us likes this. All of us uh, agree that we're at this stage, but we are. Do you think, to, to your knowledge, and I, I know you're not lawyers and you may not have kept up with it, do you think any or all of these lawsuits are justified? And then secondly, uh, what do you think could have been done to have prevented what seems to be a developing culture of this type of legal appeal uh, for you know, getting satisfaction for difficulties that have, that have come about. So we'll start, uh, David, or Clint, we'll start with you. So what are you, what's your take on all this? Yeah, I, I really, you know, wouldn't be very comfortable speaking to too many of the lawsuits. I think they would have had some people speak to them, whether it's been on Twitter, or in conversations, and that is shown back up. I'm not sure it would be wise to give too many opinions on any of them. Yeah, okay, and, and I, I get to, that. And to the degree, and to the degree, I wouldn't be informed enough to give something really strong one way or the other. Yeah. So, what about just the whole? I mean, the fact that we're here, uh, that we we have lawsuits are becoming almost commonplace now. 
yeah. in the convention. Yeah. I mean, what do you, is there no. anything to, that we could do to, to maybe dial that back? Gosh, I don't know. I hope there is. If you come up with something, I think you should announce it. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't have a problem God can't solve, but it's going to take a lot, right. I think, for us right. to get to that point and believe it. I think so. it's embarrassing. I think it's, uh, yeah. it's bewildering. It's to, you know, five or six years ago, I would have never thought these kind of lawsuits from the people that have them would be against the SBC, but as to how to curb it or to solve it or to speak to it. Yeah. I wouldn't be educated enough to do that. Okay. Very good. Jared. Um, my thought is that it speaks to the lack of health in our convention, um, both in, um, <clears throat> administering biblical justice as far as uh as far as our entities and the the reason why some are some are suing and and um the responses and i think transparency among our leadership would be beneficial um i also think that the guidepost report was a disaster um just because it's you know that's that's why two of the lawsuits are Mm -hmm. are happening um, and so, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I don't want to say too much because of the, it's ongoing litigation and, um, but I do, I do want to say that this should not, I mean, Paul is clear as a bell in the book of Corinthians that we're not supposed to go to the secular courts law to, you know, against brothers and, um, that that should be a, a last resort when you're dealing with, uh, I mean, if you're, 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 we, we should have Christian arbiters. Like we should have someone who can navigate this and two parties agree and deal with it that way instead of, and because it, it just further gives Southern Baptist a black eye, um, in the world. Um, and so I, I, I think that we preach the word is the large way where we, um, get away from these lawsuits. And we also, uh, transparency among our entities and we use language that fits with the Bible and we only make accusations based on evidence that is chargeable. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mike. I think it's, it's pretty simple. We've talked a lot tonight about biblical integrity and making sure that we're doing things according to the scriptures. And I, I agree with Jared in that the Bible is really clear about believers suing believers. And uh, so to me, that's, <clears throat> that's where the issue should end. We shouldn't be suing each other. We should figure out a way to work it out. And if, you know, innocence is innocence, you know, it's like in Nehemiah, the wall speaks. The wall speaks and tells the story. And so uh, I think, you know, I think brothers just need to quit suing each other. I think it's pretty simple. And if we're going to hold the value of biblical integrity, I think that's where we got to sit. Okay, very good. Well, let's shift gears again and uh, we'll talk about the cooperative program. Uh, there seems to be uh, undeniable uh, evidence that the cooperative program giving has been in decline for the past decade or so. I know there's a special task force that's operating right now to discover the impact of the Great Commission resurgence on cooperative program giving uh, over the time that the GCR has been going on. So maybe they will reveal some real numbers to us. But the the real numbers I found are are hard to get at because of the way the reporting has changed over the years. And maybe if we could uh, get reporting of what's actually been given from churches to the cooperative program and just look at those numbers, it seems like there has been a a pretty significant decline over the last decade. So assuming that to be true, uh, to what do you attribute that? And how would you address uh, a a dropping of churches giving to the cooperative program. So Jared, we'll start with you. Um, I think that a a big part of it is, so there we've had for the past uh, decade or so, there's been a special emphasis on reaching the cities with the gospel, which is good. I I think we should obviously reach the cities. I'm, that's why I'm nominating uh, Michael Cleary for first VP. He's a, urban church planner in Cincinnati, um, SBC church planner. And um, so we should reach the cities, but uh, something I want to emphasize is a renewed emphasis on the rural communities, um, reaching the rural communities, because the cities are, are more theologically liberal. They're further away from a clear understanding of the gospel. I realize 
right? We're I'm I'm talking practically. Mm-hmm. Obviously, God saves, um, but the low hanging fruit are the it's the rural communities in America, and so I want to encourage um, a renewed emphasis on reaching the rural communities. D- did y'all know that? About 85% or more of the cooperative program comes from the 14 southern states. And so we need to strengthen what funds the cooperative program, Mm -hmm. which is the South. Um, And so I think that we need a renewed emphasis on reaching the South. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And uh, we are going to try to keep these answers about a minute and a half or so so we can get our final statements in as well. So, uh, Brother Mike. You know, Tom. Whoops, I lost you, Mike. Are you, are you muted? Well, <coughs> all right, Mike, are you there? Okay. I'm not here, Mike. Let's go to David. And if Mike gets back on, he can jump in. So, David? Well, over the last what? decade, total CP giving has dropped by $30 million. Now, that is a significant drop. But uh, well, actual, I thought I was supposed to be answering the question. I, I, we we lost you, Mike. We we weren't hearing you. So we we'll oh. let David finish, and then we'll okay. let you well, jump I'm back sorry, on. Okay. David, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry, Mike. Um, <laughs> but SBC allocation of uh, cooperative program money has increased by one point four million, and the reason for that is because the state conventions are keeping less, and they're sending mm-hmm. more on to the SBC. State conventions have absorbed over $31 million of the decline in the last 10 years, and that while facing 24% inflation. Mm-hmm. And so the cooperative program is dropping, and per, uh, the per capita money that is available is also dropping. And this is a serious issue. But to answer your question quickly, one factor for that decline is the concern over trust and transparency. I just spent lunch with a bunch of pastors in North Arkansas, and they all told me of their concern for the trust and transparency issue, and many of them have led their churches uh, to trim their cooperative program giving because of their concerns. I encourage them to rethink that, but that, you know, perception is reality for people. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need to understand about what partly why the CP gifts are declining. Okay. Very good. Now, brother Mike, let you jump back in. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I was saying that, you know, as an unchurched kid, the first place that I heard about the cooperative program was through Sunday school, through mission friends and through Royal ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And what has been a common trend over the last decade and more is that you don't have a lot of churches doing RAs anymore, and you don't have a lot of people doing mission friends anymore. And even Sunday school has changed a lot. And so we did not replace those education pieces with anything that would help (laughs) us move the cooperative program forward in teaching our our kids uh, the importance of it. And so that's where I got my first part. So I think we've got to, we've got to address that. We've got to fix that and, uh, and, you know, provide better opportunities for education in our churches and, and start that way younger. I do agree that the last three to five years, uh, and with all the issues that we've went through, uh, it's been difficult. And you look at the last really two, almost three years, has been a complete void of leadership at the executive committee, where the president of the EC is, got, is the primary champion. I mean, he's the guy that is, is rallying the cooperative program. And so now we have someone there that I believe is going to do an incredible job in doing that. So I'm hopeful for the cooperative program. I think churches, once they see that there's going to be some trust, even some transparency, I think they're going to, I think we're going to rebound from this. I really do. Okay. Very good. Brother Clint. Yes, sir. You know, as Southern Baptists, we believe in vision. I mean, we have to have something in front of us. We stand shoulder to shoulder uh, when it comes to seeing missionaries go. I mean, you might remember at the convention when we celebrate those missionaries walking in with their flags, and that's what we believe in. And I think if we keep putting that in front of the faces of our people, we're going to see an uptick. One of the problems we've had is we, we've got to take a moment and make sure we have our doctrinal house in order, and then we can start sending out and getting behind that. I think getting behind missionaries and church planters and holding the missionaries up as our heroes 
helps with the cooperative program. Here in North Carolina, our giving statewide is up. We just celebrated even like 41% more baptisms than we did last year. So there are some really good Man. things going on in, in the country that I yeah. think we should celebrate. Amen. Very good. Well, uh, brothers, we're coming to the end of our time. I promise you an hour and a half. And so we're going to go immediately to closing statements. And Brother David, since you're scheduled to preach here soon, let me uh, give the floor to you and just anything you want to say to the people that have uh, stayed with us tonight listening. What would you like to have as your final comments? Well, thanks, Brother Tom. And thank you, my brothers, for allowing me to be a part of this with each of you. Whomever God in his sovereignty sees fit to be elected as president of the SBC, my prayer is that he will be able to lead us back to unity centered around the word of God, the cross of Christ, and evangelism and missions. Two things we all must work to avoid. We must work to avoid a drift toward liberalism, and we have to work to avoid a drift toward legalism. Both are deadly. While we stand strong on the clear scripture teaching that the office and the role of pastor should be a man, but we women should not be made to feel diminished or unwelcome in our convention. I would shudder to think where we would be as a convention were it not for the dedicated, capable, and faithful women in countless roles of leadership and service. You know, the law of gravity remains unrepealed in the natural world, and the same is true in our Southern Baptist Zion. If once great civilizations can decay, die, and lie in ruins, once great denominations can too. Now, there are some people, I think, who believe our convention has become too tangled to unravel. I don't believe that. The bathwater may be dirty, but there is a baby in it. Where bad decisions have been made, good decisions can still become the order of the day. Where individuals and groups have sinned, repentance is the door of renewal and revival. But we must value our integrity above our reputation. And when we do that, God will take care of our reputation. I think we need a president who loves and respects our convention, but understands the concerns of a growing number of grassroots Southern Baptists and who will work to have those concerns heard and addressed. You know, 45 years ago, grassroots Southern Baptists made it clear they had never authorized some of our convention leaders to surrender our principles, no matter how much some of those leaders had surrendered theirs. So I would just say if I'm elected as president of the SBC, my pledge is simple. Number one, I will support and encourage all Southern Baptists and all SBC entities and agencies in their ultimate mission of seeking to win the world to Christ as we cooperate to call out the called, pray and give faithfully to the cooperative program. And number two, I would appoint Southern Baptist to the committee on committees who will assure me and all Southern Baptists, they will only nominate people to places of service who will pledge to work for truth, trust and transparency within their respective committees trustee boards and entities. I can't imagine a single Southern Baptist who would not support these goals, even if he or she chooses not to support me. In Jean Bingham's biography of Reinhold Niebuhr, Courage to Change, she included a prayer that Niebuhr himself had written, Oh God, give us serenity to accept what we cannot, what cannot be changed, courage to change what should be changed, and wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. My prayer is that God will help Southern Baptists to have the courage to change what should be changed. And, of course, the wisdom to know why, when, and how to do so. Amen. Thank you, David. And uh, we will let you leave now and get on to more important things. But thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, brothers, for the privilege. Thanks, David. All right. Brother Mike, we'll go to you. I shared with you guys my, my testimony early on uh, that I came to know the Lord through the work of First Baptist Church Elgin, the Baptist Student Union. Every part of my life spiritually 
was affected by Southern Baptist ministry. And the beauty of all of that is that as God worked in my heart through Southern Baptist, I was able to go back into my own home. And through the years, I got to see my mom come to know the Lord. Uh, She was 40 years old, died of alcohol-related cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, But 11 months before she passed, I got to see her come to know Jesus. Um, I got to see several of my aunts and uncles come to know the Lord, people who had raised me. And, um, and although their lives were shortened by their mistakes and the diseases caused by those mistakes, uh, they're in heaven today because of the impact that Southern Baptist made on my life in making sure that I had access to the gospel through the local church and through the ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention. And so Victor Kyra Saban, when he uh, visited with me about nominating me, um, he said that I was a son of the SBC, and uh, I had never really thought about it that way, but, but I really am, and it's something that's affected my life, but also my family, and really broken generational curses in, uh, in the new family tree that God has given me through the work of what we do, and it's because at the forefront, when we're at our best, the gospel's at the forefront of everything that we do. Uh, when we're at our best, the cooperative program is leading us to be the most effective and the, and the most and the very best gospel sharing mechanism on the planet. And, uh, and so my heart would be to get us back to our roots, get us back to who we are as Southern Baptists, being people of the gospel, being people of the book, and people that cooperatively reach the world. My, my great uncle, uh, his name is Perry Noyabat, full blood Comanche man. He was a code talker in World War II. And um, he came from Riverside, uh, for, excuse me, Fort Sill Indian School here in Lawton. And in Fort Sill Indian School, he was uh, had his hair cut uh, because um, he was, uh, you know, that's what they did. They uh, punished him for speaking his native language. They um, tortured him just like it talked about in the report that was uh, done by the Department of the Interior. But yet he was recruited to serve in the military in World War II and was there on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day and served his country. And, and people often asked him, you know, why, why would you serve a country that did those things to you? And what he said was what I thought pretty profound. He said, I fought for not just who we were as a country, but mostly for what we could be. And, um, and I've learned that lesson in, in our convention. I know that there are some things, there are some issues, um, but I still love it. And, and I serve it and want to serve it not just for what it is today, but what I know it can be in the future. And so I'll do my best to to represent Southern Baptist well and lead us well in unity. Thank you, Brother Mike. Jared? Brother Jared, are you muted? You may have to unmute yourself, Jared. Okay, I don't uh, know what the problem is there with Jared. But uh, Clint, we'll go to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Tom. Yeah, our our issues are not insurmountable. Uh, I think we can stand shoulder to shoulder as we affirm the BFNM. I have brothers that do not agree with me on the law amendment, and yet I'm sure I can go forward with them because they believe and trust and affirm the Baptist faith and message. I think our intentions for gospel mission are strong. Our confession is good. Uh, we have a great hope in the call and um, the mission of Christ. I mean, what a beautiful picture of what we do. And so I I think uh, there's a whole lot to celebrate, a whole lot for us to stand on. I think it's gonna take a lot of courage in the days ahead as Baptists. I think we're gonna have to get used to uh, looking like uh, people that are different than everybody else and be glad to do that as we stand against the culture and stand for the gospel. And I think that's what the average person that calls themselves a Southern Baptist wants to do. And I look, I I want to be a part of that. And I want to provide some sort of unity. I want to put rocks down and pick up the gospel and have our convention move forward. Keep us staying on mission. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Jared. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Well, we did hear you. We're not hearing anything right now. Tom, I can't hear you. Okay, Jared, I'm hearing you. Um, um, if anybody can let him know. But I'm going to talk, okay. and uh, 
hope, hope that it's recorded. Yeah, we're hearing you. <laughs> so, uh, in conclusion, uh, one of the most important responsibilities of the SBC president is to appoint the committee on committees. And so I just wanted to share the criteria uh, in, in conclusion, um, share the criteria that I'm going to go by in selecting the committee on committees. The reason why that's so important is because the committee on committees chooses the committee on nominations, which then, you know, they're, they're voted on by the SBC and then they nominate the trustees at all of our entities. And so the SBC president chooses the committee that chooses the committee with SBC vote that chooses with SBC vote every trustee that's open at our entities. And so um, the criteria that I'm going to use uh, in choosing that committee that makes those decisions, um, they're going to have to affirm and practice the Baptist faith and message 2000 in their churches. They're going to have to believe and practice that only men can be pastors they're going to have to believe and teach that the LGBTQ plus and uh, attraction to children and desire is sin. Um, they're going to have to believe and teach the abolition of abortion and equal protection for the unborn. Um, they're going to have to believe that SBC entities should be financially transparent. And they're going to have to believe that the SBC should renew their emphasis on reaching rural communities with the gospel. And, um, you know, listener, if y'all uh, want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me on Twitter or I've got a couple of articles coming out. One is for the Center for Baptist Leadership and one is for American Reformer. And so just be checking out those ministries and looking for those articles. But I, I love the SBC and I believe our best days are ahead of us. But to get to those best days, it's going to be in lockstep with Scripture, not in opposition to it. It's going to be in lockstep with our confession, which confesses Scripture, not in opposition to it. And so I hope to lead in unity around biblical faithfulness. All right. Well, thank you, brothers, so much for giving of your time and being willing to field these questions, sometimes about awkward uh, matters. And uh, yet we know that all of you love the SBC. All of you want to see her best days in front of us. So we're grateful Man, that's right. for you hmm. being here tonight. And thank you for joining in and listening tonight as well. This is being recorded. We'll make it available so others can listen in who didn't get to join us tonight. Uh, God bless you. Pray for these brothers. Pray for the SBC. I hope to see you in Indianapolis. Good night. God bless you, Tom. Thanks, brother. Thank you.